we might very much argue that it's not necessarily the best ideas that win. It's the stories told around the best ideas that win. And we are joined by Frederick Herren. How are you, Frederick? I am doing great. How are you? I'm well. Good to see you. Good to see you. So for those few who don't know who you are, I'll, uh, I'll introduce you. Um, so Frederick is an author and global keynote speaker. He wrote 10 books, one of which, the idea book, was included in the 100 best business books of all time. Super impressive. He has been invited to speak at over 2,000 conferences on subjects like business creativity, innovation, and change. In the last 20 years, as a creativity explorer, he has interviewed thousands of people, of creative people, from all over the world. So it's good to have you with us, and this time I'm interviewing you. Yeah, I, I actually prefer both, interviewing or interviewees. I enjoy both. So actually we're going to have like a, a conversation, and the first uh, question I wanted to ask you was about this term that you coined, uh, creativity exploration. What does that yeah. mean? Actually, I'm not going to take credit for it. I didn't uh, coin the term. My, at that time, eight-year-old son, Lucas, coined the term. And he was, uh, it's actually a good story. Uh, he was supposed to do a presentation in school. Uh, his first, because uh, I'm a speaker, this is his first ever pre presentation in for, in, for a group of uh, people, like his first real speech, so to speak. And the topic was, what does your parents do for a living? And he was supposed to say, my father is a creativity expert. And we practiced it, and I taught him how to you know, look the people in the eye and stand up straight and all of this. And then he came there, and of course, you know, as an eight-year-old, he kind of screwed it up a little bit. So instead of saying, my father is a creativity expert, he said, my father is a creativity explorer. And my wow. wife was there to hear it, and she said, wait, this is much better. So for the last 20 years, I was a creativity expert. But for the last two years, I've been a creativity explorer, and I love it so much more. Because the definition of explore is to venture into unknown territory in order to learn more about it. And I think that that's, that uh, in, encourages creativity, uh, curiosity, and, and humbleness, I think. So, uh, yeah. So since then, that's what I do. I explore human creativity. Actually, the, the, the things that you talk about actually go to the level of talking of taking creativity as actually the foundation of what we usually talk about, which is innovation, right? And mm. instead of focusing on innovation, you say we need to focus on creativity. Can you yeah. talk about what you mean and how one leads to the other and what are the important things that you saw? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, so to me, it's a bit tricky with the word innovation because many people have many different definitions. If you ask a group of 100 people what they mean by the word innovation, you get a lot of different answers. But to me, innovation is the process of making ideas happen. For example, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint Mona Lisa. That's an idea. But painting Mona Lisa is the innovation. It's the process of making ideas happen. Now, creativity is the whole process from uh, the curiosity phase where we're just looking and uh, getting inspiration and learning new things to having a problem that we want to solve and then thinking about the problem like Archimedes thinking about it all. And then suddenly the aha moment, having the idea and then testing it out. And then it, that's we start to innovate and then launching the idea and evaluating it and starting over again. So the creativity is the whole process. And I'm fascinated by the whole process, every single aspect of it. All, uh, all industries, all countries, all, lev all levels of creativity, uh, artistic creativity, engineering creativity, all kinds of it. There's many, 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 many facets of human creativity. And when you talk about process, because that's actually, you know, I've worked for very large corporations, and, and we talked about that uh, in, in the past before. And, yes. and there's always seems to be um, innovation, seems to be like, a, like something people talk about, but and try to create, I would say, artificially sometimes. Do you think it's actually something, creativity slash innovation, that can actually be taught? Or it's like you're a football player because you have some certain DNA or some upbringing, but it's not something that can be taught? Yeah. Well, actually, I guess that's a good, that's a good analogy, isn't it? Because some people are born with um, uh, perfect ball control. I mean, they have almost like perfect pitch, but if they just 
touch the ball and they can somehow control it. But everyone can become better at playing soccer. My father was actually a music teacher. And it's even better to use music as an example because some people are actually bought with musical skill. Like they have, per like my brother, he has perfect pitch. So he was born with perfect pitch. I'm not born with perfect pitch. So uh, yeah, my, my brother inherited my father, I inherited my mother. So my brother, of course, is much easier for him to play an instrument. Because, and I actually stopped playing an instrument when he, he was playing the piano, I played the bass, but he was better at the bass than I was, even though that wasn't his main instrument. He's just naturally, he can hear a song once and play it. Mm -hmm. So yes, he's born with perfect pitch and a sense of musicality, but everyone can learn to play an instrument. And my father said this, because he was a, music, he was a musician and a music teacher. He said, you can teach anyone to play an instrument. But the only way to make them a musician is through inspiration. Like Michael Jackson would listen to Frank, Frank Sinatra and, and all these greats that lived before. He would look at what everyone, and he would be inspired by that. He would take different ideas from them, and he became Michael Jackson. But if you just focus on teaching creativity, uh, uh, teaching music, hold your fingers like this, that doesn't make you a musician. It's the same with creativity. You can teach a lot of creativity techniques, but the true way to make someone creative is to make sure that they are inspired by looking at create what other people are doing or, or just being like if you interview any creative person they, what triggers their creativity is being inspired by other creative people so inspiration is very important i think that's very important when we talk about creativity in companies so you you yes you should teach creativity yes it can be taught but more importantly it should be inspired you know actually that that brings uh, also the the story you told about your son and i'm thinking as you were talking Actually, the foundation of us as human beings, as adults, is so much based on how we were brought up in our education. And I think, I would, I would guess like 95% of education globally, unless there are some maybe, you know, where you live, some, some other uh, experiences, creativity or the the act of being inspired during your school days is it doesn't exist we, we, we are actually taught a subject and then we're tested on it there isn't like a I don't know a history lesson where you're inspired by the history teacher or maybe the figures you really have to remember dates and and wars and events and you know whatever and yeah. don't you think the yeah. world really needs to backtrack into how we're, we school our children in order to have a better you know, better uh, crea creators, better innovators? Okay, yes and no. So this is classic, it's the, uh, the most watched TED talk of, of all, I think, is Sir Ken Robinson's classic speech about uh, school, in, school killing creativity. And it's definitely true it, if you generalize. On the other hand, there are some amazing teachers. In, I would say my father is a great example. He was gonna, when he was gonna teach us, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, to read maps, like how to read a map. He was able to get the local flying club to lend the plane for free. And it, all of us in that class, we went, we squeezed into this tiny little airplane and we flew over our neighbor, uh, over where we lived. And we had the, the map in our, then we could look down and see that our house actually looked like a little square. And, and here are the roads. And suddenly the, the map came alive and then we landed and then we continued to talk about how to read the map. That's a very creative way to teach how to read a map. And he did it, it didn't cost anything. He was sponsored by the flying club who loved the idea. So there are t teachers like this everywhere. But more importantly, yes, I think we should change the school system. I, have, I homeschool my kids, by the way. So I, uh, oh, which means wow. I'm, in, I'm in total control of their creativity. I'm a huge fan of the concept. That's, uh, okay, that's also a big responsibility. But actually, that's why, by the way, I said 95% because people yeah. like... Uh, right, I, so. I, I agree with you. But uh, more importantly, because I get this sometimes, we need the school kills creativity, and it does. But all creative people also went through school. So wait a minute, if some people go through school and come out super creative and some people don't, maybe we shouldn't uh, criticize the school system. Maybe what we should criticize is the parents. Because my argument is that even if school doesn't teach creativity, school can teach you a lot of knowledge. And it's important to have knowledge to be creative at least the way I look at it. The more knowledge we have, the more information we have, the more things we have that we can combine. So let school give that to the kids and then teach creativity yourself to your kids. Because I mean, if you interview people 
and you say, uh, is, uh, why, why, where did you get your creativity from? A lot of people will actually say, I have this very special teacher. Yes. It's, it's a, quite, a, quite a common answer. You have three answers. It's a te- uh, I had a teacher I loved or I had, I had a teacher I uh, hated. And then, uh, and then it's, I had a teacher who was mean. That's like... Uh, those, and that caused me to, uh, of, to skip class and do other bad. things. And yeah, okay. The most important, the most common answer is my parents taught me my creativity. So uh, in, let's, uh, let's focus on that as parents. That's our job. Let's co- school gives them knowledge. And as parents, we teach them creativity. I think that could be a good responsibility for, our, for all parents out there. So that, that actually brings me to the second thing I was thinking about, which is also a, a, a subject you, you talk about, which is the, the inspirational figure. And if, if we go back to the, um, if we go back to, the uh, to, to an organization, and, and uh, many organizations try different, uh, let's call it innovation programs, and they, you know, they try to shake up who they are. Yeah. But isn't it really like that teacher, you need that manager, that executive that actually pulls the company after them or, or, or doesn't even do something intentionally as now we're in a program of innovation, but actually just does things and provides an atmosphere of you can follow me or do your thing because I'm doing my thing. That means that you can do your thing. Isn't exactly. that the essence? I totally agree. I mean, if you if you worked uh, if you used to work for Steve Jobs, would you think that you would be inspired that you should you would be allowed to be creative? If you work for Elon Musk now, do you think you are in, allowed to be creative? Of course you do. So it's 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 the same thing. And I always say this if I talk to leaders that you can have innovation programs, you can teach innovation, you can bring in speakers like me, you can do whatever you can all great to do all those things. But more importantly is that you do creative things and that you make sure that these stories are being told around the organization, that they get spread. My, one of my favorite, uh, you know, I'm from Sweden, so we have IKEA or IKEA, as everyone likes to say, but it's actually IKEA. IKEA, okay, uh, I'll remember IKEA. That. Yes, exactly. I taught you something. <laughs> <laughs> and he, the founder, Ingvar Kamprad, he was such a great uh, innovator when it comes to questioning st- tiny things, every little detail of the business. Why can't we do it this way? Why are we doing things like this constantly? And that that spread through the DNA. But IKEA was also very good at picking up those stories and telling these stories over and over again. It, they were not made up stories. They were real stories, but they kept telling them over and over again. And that became like the folklore of IKEA. This is how we this is how Ingvar thinks. This is how we should think. So collect those stories and spread those stories, by far the most important. And not only from the manager, also from any, uh, any kind of story of a, someone who does something creative. Spread those stories because it inspires other people. So, you know, storytelling is something I, uh, I like to talk about and we talked about before. And yes. how storytelling can actually uh, impact if any topic actually succeeds because uh, it doesn't matter that the let's call it the thing itself is good or not good is being able to carry the the message is there uh you know we talked about uh what we uh coined together uh so we didn't have a a third party like your son uh uh, we 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 called it corporate telling how do you tell a story within a corporate and i started thinking actually humanity since the beginning has has lived around you know, the bonfire and stories. And some of these stories from thousands and thousands of years ago are, are still even the backbone of society, if you think what religion is about and, and many things that relate to history. And, and, and it's so embedded in who we are. Mm-hmm. And then I'm thinking, then uh, you know, fast forward however many thousands of years later, we have the super advanced society with corporations who built technology. And it's why isn't it the most obvious thing and most proliferated idea notion that storytelling is so important and why do we even have to argue for it where in everything else that we do and everything else that shaped our society stories were like the backbone but all of a sudden you come to some super i don't know and i'm i'm not talking about my own corporation i'm talking about any generic b2b uh, corporation, and you have to convince people that storytelling is important. And where, are, what about your story? How do you think we got to a stage where, where this kind of continuation of storytelling broke when it came to doing business? Yeah, that that is a very good question because if you if you look at the people that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say are innovative, and maybe you can even say it's successful. 
we might very much argue that it's not necessarily the best ideas that win. It's the best. Uh, I, it's the the stories told around the best ideas that win. So the, the, the classic Steve Jobs, one more thing. That's an epic storytelling technique. Yeah. The way he presented the new products in the storytelling techniques that he used, or or, or we can you know, Elon Musk, <laughs> even the even even throwing uh, even throwing a hammer into the window of a truck and it's it breaking in itself. <laughs> it's fascinating storytelling if you think about it. It, it went very viral. So I'm a, I would totally agree with you. I don't talk so much about story. I used I used I talk more about rhetoric, and I think this could be a trick to get it to people to think it's more important. Okay. Because story, the word story, we it's maybe easily connected to like we read stories to our children, or stories are made up. So mm. it, we should technically have two words for story. One that means made up, some. Uh, uh, st story story, which is made up story, or real story, which means uh, uh, telling about something that actually happened. And I think that's my deal. So I talk about rhetoric. Rhetoric is, is basically the art of getting people on your side by telling a story in a way that gets them convinced. So it's more, more corporate speak, so to speak, mm -hmm. but it also focuses more on the, on the power of stories. So to learn rhetorical techniques, to present the story in a way that get people not only to enjoy the story, but also to agree with what the message of the story is, to get them on your side. Because it's not enough, it's not the one who tells the best story who wins, it's the one who tells the story that people actually want to be believe in and, and follow that, that wins. And that's where rhetoric comes in. Yeah, I think that nuance is actually super important. And also mm -hmm. in, in, in what you were saying, and, and we talked about corporate telling is, and this is what I try to do is kind of create a mental picture in somebody's head on, on, on what I want them to imagine. Yeah. And, and rhetoric is actually the way of building that image in the best way. So that's a, yeah. so that, that's a really good clarification. By the way- And it's a great, it's, sorry, but it's a great example. The, the most epic of, of all ideas are in politics because you're basically only selling an idea. You, get the, you have two candidates, they're selling one idea and, and at the end we vote on which one we want uh, which idea we believe the most in. And then, of course, politics is, is all about making that idea happen. But at an election, that's all it's about. And that shows that it's not necessarily the best politician who, or the, the best idea that wins. It's the person who can convince other people that this is the idea you should believe in. That's the politician that wins. Do you, do you so, yeah, I, I, t I totally agree. And, and, and let's not get into politics. <laughs> <laughs> We can get into the rhetoric of it. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. you know, actually, it's uh, it's interesting because it, it, in politics, it, it seems like that today, and, and you know, we can kind of take this to where we are as a society with social media and the pace of the, uh, and how fast the world is moving. That actually, the doing part has decreased, I think, substantially compared to the rhetoric. So if in the past, because the news was slow and the world was slower, once you said something, you actually had the time to execute and people then kind of judged you on whether you did what you said. But now the world is moving so fast. You can say so many things on a daily basis. And, you know, Trump kind of blew up uh, uh, Twitter with messages. Like I think he had like 40, 30, 20. It was like an average uh, Twitter day for him. And how can you check if he executed on all these things? So even rhetoric kind of took over execution, which is interesting. Is that, is that, even, is that even something that you think will send the world in, into like an interesting or crazy path? Mm, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, yes and no, because I, I think at the end, we evaluate people on what they actually do. I mean, of course, it's also about the story you are telling about what you did. Uh, rhetoric is not only about you selling an idea, it's also about you selling what you did, which is equally important, especially in politics. Like if we, so Donald Trump trying to be reelected, I think it, he failed in the rhetoric to explain to people why they should, why what he had done. And he got, he was stuck in a, he was stuck in a rhetoric that got him elected, but that's not the same rhetoric that gets him reelected. I think that's where he stumbled. He, I would have done it very differently if I was him for the reelection campaign so i think yeah so i so i don't think i don't think you should look at stories as something that is yeah on that that's something that we lose that well, we're just going to be selling stories and not do anything i think it's the total opposite i think we should have a lot of people talking and and then we should select the best idea we believe in and then we should go and do that one 
And I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm fascinated. If you look at how I'm, I'm, like you're doing a podcast now, that's great. But how many the CEOs are actively not telling their own company story? It's not about taking so much time. And of course, they should be focused mainly on being CEOs, but that they're not, there's, I saw some statistics, a number of CEOs that are not, not even on LinkedIn at all or don't post at all. And I don't get that. I don't get that at all because people are want to follow. They want to learn from the company. They want to learn from the people who are in charge. They want to hear the stories. So I, uh, st- set aside a little bit of time at least to communicate what you're doing and you get people excited and they will help you. I wonder how you, did you see, um, you know, the storytelling of a CEO or the executives in the corporation? Did you see now the pandemic actually? Uh, forcing uh, because of circumstance, because actually the only way to communicate is via video, not through personal meetings, is that actually storytelling has gotten broader and bigger and more embedded in, in our business than before. Have you noticed that? You know what? Yes, I have. And the num- I've, interviewed, I've done quite a lot of interviews during COVID uh, directly with leaders through Zoom. And they have, many of them have explained that suddenly they're doing weekly town halls, for example, and they used to do monthly town hall or once a quarter town hall. Now they're doing weekly, men, mainly from a mental um, wellness perspective, because people are concerned about, they want, they don't, they're stressed, they don't know what's happening, so they want to be informed more on a more regular basis. That was, it was, it was driven not from a communication perspective, not from a storytelling perspective, from a mental well-being perspective. I think it's, very, it's a very good reason to do it. On top of that, I mean, as a bonus effect, they started communicating, you got more storytelling going. But it, actually to me, it did, the, I've been studying companies for 25 years and uh, speaking at conferences and, I think the most interesting one is actually not COVID, but sustainability that came in about one year before COVID. Hmm. And suddenly the leadership came up and said, you know what? Sustainability is not just something we're going to talk about as something nice to have. We really have to change the way we run our business. And we need to get our people to understand that and put their company into a much, like put the story about their company in a much bigger con- like. If, this, if the company is a character, the story became much bigger that they put this ca- character into it. And it's fascinating to see how the rhetoric changed when, when company leaders didn't only talk about us, our company versus our competition, but talked about us, our company in the role that we play in the global development goals or in, in a global perspective with all the stakeholders. And I'm fascinated what's going to happen next. When we're out of COVID, we take the global uh, sustainability goals and companies playing a role in that and combine that with the well-being, caring mentality that COVID kind of put in. I think we put those two together. It's going to be fascinating to see the stories the companies will, pe- will play, start uh, telling in, in a year or so. That, that, that's super interesting. Now, actually, talking about post-COVID, Um, But I want to take you, before we go post-COVID, I want to take you back to my experience and also hear about how you handled it, because here we are talking uh, through uh, video, and we're sort of confined to this square that, you know, dictates what we see and, you know, how we behave. And uh, if I had to imagine uh, you being invited to a conference, let's say on a, a, I don't know, Thursday noon, or Wednesday noon, then you would fly out like two days before, Uh, you would be at the place, you would, you know, you would get your stuff together at the hotel, you would fix your PowerPoint, you would do some other meetings, you go to lunch, you go to dinner, you come back, then you do the conference, then you wrap up, you meet people, and like that, your week disappears. Yeah. And... And that same conference and that same week is now starting exactly on the hour when the Zoom starts and finishes exactly when the Zoom ends one hour later. And all of a sudden, your entire week is free. So (laughs) theoretically, we got back all these amazing hours that we spent traveling, but you don't see the world, you don't interact with people, and there is no energy that, you know, you feel when there's a crowd and you ask questions. And, you know, I've seen you perform, you perform. And you listen to the crowd and you, you, you throw jokes. And I, 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 I imagine that not everything is like scripted and you kind of, and, and now you're in this box, right? So first I wanted to ask you how it makes you feel. Second, I wanted to ask you if you now think that we actually needed to, now when you're doing it, you're a performer, but you, all the business people globally don't usually perform on stages like you have. 
Mm. Now we need to acquire this new skill of performance. How, how do you see this being played out before and after? Yeah, a lot, a lot of interesting questions there. First of all, I was a big... I, didn't, I was not a big fan of, of video, uh, like virtual speaking. I did not believe in it. I, I, I will readily admit I did not believe in it. I said it's not the same thing. But of course, one year ago, I had to build a home studio. I should have done it earlier, but uh, <laughs> there, was not re there wasn't really a market for it earlier. And suddenly everything went virtual. I have my home studio in, in a r separate room in my house. What I quickly realized that doing a virtual speech is actually not very different than doing a big speech. We're talking 500, 5,000, 10,000 people in an audience. Because when you're 5,000 people in, a, in an audience, you actually don't interact with them so much because you're, they're too far away. You don't really see them. And they actually, most of them, actually look on you on the big screen behind. So they actually are attending a virtual speech. We mm. just happen to sit in the same room. Mm. So, so when I do, do a virtual speech, I do 50% thinking I'm speaking for 10,000 people. And 50% I'm thinking I'm speaking to one person because it, this is so intimate. And if you take, if you're able to keep those two things in your head at the same time, it creates actually a very, very intimate feeling and still an experience. So I think it works brilliantly. Now, when it came to the, so that was the actual time on the stage. But as you said, all the time around it has totally changed. Uh, for me, you could have said that before COVID, I was a professional traveler. I would spend 90% hmm. of my time traveling and 10% of my time speaking Same here. or less than that. Yes. But uh, I did that because I like to say, what I said about creativity is inspiration. So the whole idea of going to uh, France and then Bangladesh and then Sri Lanka and then China to get or to see what the world looks like. I think if you're going to be a speaker, you need to have this feeling that I understand what happens in the whole world. And you get to see all this different, like there's a, take a taxi in India versus taking one in China and different hotels, different industries. And yes, I, you lose all of that. It became crucial for me to connect and do video interviews with people all around the world. And I've mm. never interviewed more people during this, this year. But the, the plus, of course, is it's much easier. Like yeah, I interviewed, for example, I don't know, head of design at car, uh, Ford Motor Company, or you for, <laughs> for that matter. Like it would be almost, it would be such a hassle to get that meeting actually confirmed with both of us being in Detroit at the same time and make sure that, you know, check into the reception. It would take a whole day to make that one hour interview. Now I can do five of them in a day if I want to. So it's, but it's crucial to do those and not think I can just sit at home and then go online and do a speech once a week without feeling that I, without having left my home and become this isolated person in Singapore and just sit and and think I understand the world or play with my kids. It, it, that doesn't work. You need, so it's never been more important to have a global mindset in a time where we cannot travel. So what do you think will be the, just your guess on the proportion of when we go back, how many real conferences will you go to versus being invited to these virtual conferences? Is it like- I think, yeah, I think we will have much more conferences. Humans love to meet. Mm -hmm. I don't think the question is how many percent of the conferences we used to have will now be virtual. I think the answer is how many more conferences will we have in the future? Because suddenly you can create, I mean, that's what Clubhouse has shown us. We can have, me we can have meetings about virtually everything and people can just sign up and go sign up with 100 people or 12 people or whatever and do it on audio without any organization whatsoever. That, those my meetings are not... It would not have happened otherwise. Like what we're doing now, this is a conversation that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So way more human conversations, one-on-ones or one-to-many or many-to-many. -many. And I can't wait to see what technology is going to be developed to make sure we can have even more interesting meetings between humans virtually. I think we're just scratching on the surface for what this could be. Ac it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, actually, on the, on the point of creativity and the timing, I think if you think about the video products that were available as the pandemic broke, yeah. they were not suited. If, even if you think about, uh, you know what, I don't want to be sued by anybody. You know, name the big video platforms that are being used for meetings. They're pretty basic. And sometimes yeah. when I press oh. present... I, I'm not able to see the, the people in the in the meeting, and sometimes it's 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 hard to to share my desktop, and it, it does a funny thing, and they see these. I know, so, I know. so 
They I like to say, I like to say that COVID. If we're gonna one good thing with COVID, at least it had good timing. Because imagine if it would have happened five years ago, but we didn't have an, the technology; just wasn't there for the whole world to meet virtually. That would have made life terrible and much more inefficient. At least it came when we were just ready for it. But it has suddenly created this huge market for these products. And now, of course, like anywhere else, when there's a market for something, people start innovating and invest money in it. And I can't wait to see what it's going to look like 10 years from now. It's going to be going to have some fascinating technologies for meeting virtually. And we will laugh at how we did it in 2020. Uh, meetings and education and everything else. Uh, uh, by the way, so I think that's actually a really good setup for what I call the exponential question. Yes. And the exponential question is how I like to kind of maybe take us and port us to the future uh, by taking the extreme of whatever topic and seeing how it will play out, right? So if you talk about, you know, your domain of creativity, uh, you talk about rhetoric and, and, and innovation and leadership, if, if, you th if you take how technology is evolving, AI, machine learning, uh, decision-making, uh, the creation uh, and creation by machines and not by humans uh, or the combination thereof, if you take that to the extreme, yeah. what, it, and really, you know what, I, I, we don't need to talk about five years. Let's talk about 10, 15, 20. Sure. Where do you think that will go as far as the, the, the mashup between machine and machines and humans and how that will affect creativity, leadership, and decision making? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. I haven't spoken so much about it, but I would love to answer this question because because I study creativity over and over and over again, I hear people saying, oh, now that AI comes, now that machine learning comes, we should focus on the one thing that computers cannot do, which is to be creative. And I don't believe in this. I think it's that is the absolute wrong approach to it. Because my definition of creativity is that you take two things and you combine them. You take a phone and a computer, you combine it, you have an iPhone, right? You, you take a, a camera and a, a computer and a car, you have a self-driving car. So every or, idea Or an idea and a book and you create an idea book. That's what I did. <laughs> or you have gla glass and eyes, you have glasses, right? Okay. Any idea is a combination of of previously existing things. If we agree that this is true, now what the computer can do is you can take, you can put in a billion ideas into a computer with artificial intelligence, and it can combine a billion trillion different combinations. And with machine learning and artificial artificial intelligence, it can also evaluate which of these combinations will actually work out the best. Uh, there's a fascinating example right now with the latest, it came out a couple of weeks ago, the latest machine learning, the open AI, where they put into a, to an AI, create a chair inspired by an avocado, and out comes hundreds of chairs looking like avocados, 3D models of what it could look like, and they, I, there's no way you can tell it's done by a computer. This is, the, and then it can also pick which one that would actually, yeah, which most likely people would like based on if you run through what people kind of shares people buy. So I call this creativity to the power of computers. We shouldn't say AI. Uh, can't do everything. Ex we should focus on creativity because computers cannot be creative. We should say computers can be infinitely more creative than we can be. Therefore, we should create AI that tries to create this. There's a beautiful example of a of a where they create a concert hall by putting in all the algorithms for how you create the perfect sound in a concert hall send it into the computer, and out came this concert hall that looks like an inside of the stomach of a whale. No human wow. would ever think of creating a concert hall looking like this. But interestingly enough, it's absolutely stunning. But more importantly, the sound is perfect because this computer tried one trillion or whatever, one billion different ways of trying out the sound without sleeping, without, you know, in, in a couple of days, and out comes this perfect concert hall based on the algorithms of sound. These are the kind of questions you should be thinking. And when you think like that, the more the big question then becomes, we shouldn't even create the problems for the AI. We should create AI that start asking interesting questions and then goes out and sol solves them for us and say, this is a question you should have asked. I think that's, uh, I really like the, the optimistic and proactive and assistive approach 
on technology and not looking at it in a doomsday kind of manner and saying, oh, it's going to take over or it's going to replace. It's, it's, it's going to do things that we don't haven't been able to even imagine, like the, the whale architecture. Um, and it's going to make our lives better. And it's just about the, the balance of, you know, uh, I think uh, we will change in, in, in ways that I think we can't even imagine right now. You know, what we will do while they, they, they create or design the next building, we will need to think of something else to do. And, and by the way... Oh, yeah. I, and I, I don't I like this. You know, people say that there's, uh, there's no jobs left. If you travel a little bit more than most people do, when you go out and look what the world looks like right now, you realize that there is infinite number of problems for us to solve. And when we've solved those, then we can, then we can start wondering what jobs we are left for us. But at the moment, there's so many problems left to solve. So let's solve them and let's use all the technology we can find to do that. So I think actually that's a, an amazing way to wrap up. So I want to thank you for your time and uh, creative creativity and ideas, and I really enjoyed our conversation. and uh, And see you soon in person, maybe even. Uh, yeah, or virtually. Or I'm virtually. Up for everything. Yeah, great. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Good talking to you, Frederick. You too. Bye bye. So thank you, everybody who tuned in, who listened, who watched, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.